Bibles tonight for our Bible study time. I'd like for you to turn again to Nehemiah chapter 2. And I didn't think when I first did this that we'd be going back to Nehemiah, but we are. And I don't, I want to continue, and I've got a third lesson to continue with the first two that we have brought in this. And they've been a blessing to my heart, and I trust to yours also. God's Word is always good. You can always find something in it. But in chapter 2, verse 1, And it came to pass in the month Nisan, in the twentieth year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him. And I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been a before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king saith unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of harm. Then I was very sore afraid, and said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not thy countenance be said? When the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lies the waste, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are, cons- are consumed with fire. Then the king said unto me, What dost thou request? So I prayed to the Lord God of heaven, and I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, and thou wouldest send me to Ju- unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. And the king saith unto me, The queen also sitting by him, For how long shall thy journey be? When wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send to me, and I set him a time. Moreover, I said unto the king, If it please the king, let letters be given to me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come into Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that it and a letter unto the king Asaph, the keeper of the king's force, that he might give me timber to make beams of the gates of the palace which appertaineth to the house, and for the wall of the city, and for that house I shall enter to it. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. And Father, thank you tonight for the privilege of being here. Thank you for your people. And Father, thank you for what you're going to do for us in your word tonight. Thank you for your word that is quick and powerful, that it is filled with the good news and about our Savior, things that pertain to him that are given to us for our admonition and learning. And I pray that will God give us something, give me the words, may I be able to break it down in such a way that I understand it, that as you have given it unto me, and that I may present it, that it would be understandable, that it would be able to be meat into the souls of people, that it would help them along life's way. And I pray that, O oh God, that you would just meet with us tonight, give us something. May we rejoice in your word, and thank you, O oh God, for what you're going to do in our lives. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Now, in the last two weeks before this, we have talked about, first of all, a burden, getting a burden and having a burden. We talked about uh, having a burden uh, the first week and the effects of a burden upon our life. And burdens do have an effect upon us. And so we talked about that. Now last week we talked about getting God's attention, didn't we? Some things in our life to get God's attention. And so we talked about those. Now, with this in mind, that first week, the effects of burdens, and the second week, getting God's attention, tonight, in conclusion... Before the end of the message, I want to talk about secrets of success. Now, Nehemiah had a burden, and we see that he got God's attention. And now I want us tonight, before that we end the service, we're going to talk about secrets of success. And it's given to us right here in the book of Nehemiah in this chapter. Many times we want success in our life, don't we? Anybody that wants to do anything wants to be successful at it. And God wants our Christian life to be successful. Now, a businessman, I, he works long hours. There's tedious hours in a businessman's life uh, of running that business. And there's a lot more to it than just saying I've got a business. And uh, teaching school, uh, being a plumber, doing anything. It's not just uh, uh, you have to 
but put some forth some effort to be a success in it. And to be a successful Christian, we just can't sit on the pew and say be a, a success at it. And so Nehemiah gives us some examples of here in this second chapter and these verses that I gave you that of uh, success in our life. And so let's, uh, let's look at these. Let's just jump right into it and let's get, get down. And later on, we'll tie it up. And I'm going to talk with you about uh, Nehemiah's secret for success. And you know, everybody's got, wants the secret, don't they? Secret recipe. Uh, yeah, somebody's wanting that secret recipe for that special lasagna or that special recipe for uh, home-baked chicken or whatever. But anyway... Uh, God gives us, through Nehemiah, secrets of success. And we're going to see that tonight, I hope. Now, let's look at verse 1. And it came to pass in the month, Nisan. Now, that's mainly, sometimes it goes into March, but mainly in the month of April. Now, if you were to pick one month, it would be April. Nisan reflects mainly April. And so some of you were born in the month of Nisan, like Emily here was born in the month of Nisan. Now, that's the, the first month of the Jewish year calendar. And you began uh, with Nisan, and that's the first month. The last month is Shizlu, uh, uh, December. And so uh, let's just uh, notice that here that uh, in this, that it was in the month Nisan. Now, you go back into the last verse that uh, up there, and you go back into the first verse, excuse me, uh, of this previous chapter, goes to verse 1, chapter 1, and uh, Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and he came to in the month of Chislu. And in the month of Chislu, now you go from December, January, February, March, and April, counting it's four months has passed. Four months has passed uh, in this. And so if we look at the, the giving of the time here, four months has passed. And uh, so... What's it Nehemiah doing? What's, uh, what's he into? Uh, what's he waiting on? Uh, he's waiting on God. Yeah. Now, he's patient. And four months have passed. Now, you and I, we, uh, we learn a lesson here, that of patience. Don't get ahead of God. Now, that's one lesson that we learn. That's not the secret that I'm talking about, but we could put it right in there. But he learned patience. And he gives it to us, being patient, waiting upon God. Now, many times we pray, oh, God, give me patience now, don't we? Uh, we're living in a quick uh, remedy situation life. We want everybody to, uh, everything quick. Yeah. Drive through the drive-in restaurant. If you don't get your sandwich in one minute's time, you get a complain, you get one free. And uh, so uh, it's uh, just about to, at that point, isn't it? Uh, we love that uh, instant grits, instant potatoes. We love everything in, in the instant line. But God wants us to wait, I say, on the Lord, the psalmist said. Wait upon him. Now, you and I will make our greatest mistakes when we rush and want to get ahead of God. And when we have a burden, we want to see something done, we automatically, we throw a jumper into it in full sway. And, but many times, that may happen, and God may open the door that quickly. But God wants us to be ready to be wait waiting and be patient for his moving. Now, if you and I are not waiting for God's moving, if God is not in the moving business, if God is not in the stirring business, if God is not in that for at the time, we're wasting our time. But during that time, we see that here that God is moving in the lives of people and events. But notice that he was patient. Now, you and I know there's a favorite verse here that in Isaiah, in Isaiah uh, 40 and uh, verse 39, for, uh, excuse me, verse 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles and shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Now, you and I, we want to run and not be weary, don't we? Uh, you and I want to be able to walk and not faint. Right. Now, what's the secret in there? What is the purpose in uh, waiting? That together the strength and waiting there for God in His moving that we can mount up with the wings of eagles. Now, so he waited four months, and nothing apparently at the time was happening. Now, as it was his custom, I don't know how many times that he appeared before the king in a day's time, 
but in four months' time that he had been into the king's presence on numerous occasions. Now remember that he had been praying. He hadn't quit praying. He was still praying. And he was still looking for God to give the answer that he could go back into Jerusalem in the land of Judah and rebuild the walls that they had, the, the Jews that had gone up before about 150 years ahead and had that time, they knuckled, they backed down, they quit, and they got defeated, and nothing happened. Just got a little temple built, and they were backed off, and they quit. Now he is praying. Now look in verse 2. Wherefore the king saith unto me, uh, so he went before, let me go back and let's uh, read again verse 1. And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, or Nisan, in the twentieth year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before sad in his presence. Now he had not been sad. He had not been, uh, uh, his eyes were not drooping. His eyes did not show sadness. Have you ever looked into the eyes of a sad person? Do you ever read the expressions of people? Uh, well, I'm preaching, they're preaching. I, believe it or not, I'm looking at your expressions. I look at your expressions. Uh, you know, when I look from the left and I look to the right, I, I'm looking at you. I'm reading your expressions of what, uh, what you're showing me in your face. And when somebody is talking to me, I look at their expressions. I may not look like it, but... I'm not cross-eyed and look this way and look that way, but anyway, I, I like to look at people's expressions. And oftentimes we read those expressions. We know that something has happened ahead of time, don't we? And notice he said, I had not been said before time. And I had not give, given anything away. I had not given my burden away. But on this time, do you think that it could have been God moving in his heart at the right time? to move in his heart that, that he would have that sad look on his face? I believe so. I believe that God pinched Moses so that, uh, that the princess there, when she found him in the ark, that her heart would be touched for the cry of that little boy. And now I believe that here that God just saddened his eyes. And you know Abraham Lincoln, you ever looked at the pictures in the countenance of Abraham Lincoln, how sad his face was? And that was carrying the burden of the great uh, civil war upon his soul there at that time. Carried a great burden. And then said the king, uh, verse 2, Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but the sorrow of heart. Now that's a loaded question. We may look over at that real quick. Uh, we may just glance over it and not realize that this, uh, the king of the Medo-Persian Empire, when he suspected that somebody was sad, he began to ask questions. And the question was, that would be upon his mind, now, don't you think that these uh, kings of the Medo-Persian Medo Empire and the Babylonians and so forth, that they were gentle souls? They were wicked, harsh people. And uh, they were pagans. And uh, they were co commonly... People were commonly trying to, uh, to form coups and to kill them. And so that's the reason that they had somebody to taste the food and everything, uh, to make sure that they weren't going to kick over by poison food. That's uh, Nehemiah's job. If he kicked over, the king uh, knew that not to eat it. But anyway, he, has, uh, he says, why is your countenance? Why are you sad? Now notice the phrase here that uh, in the next verse, then I was sore afraid. Now why was that? He had, uh, I mean constantly, many times a day, he was in there serving like a butler uh, to, to the king. He was into his presence many times a day serving him. Now why would he be afraid? And it was because of that question. The king's suspicion may be, uh, doesn't he like me? Uh, the king may be thinking in his heart here in there, that uh, he's dissatisfied with me. Now, if the king, uh, and so Nehemiah is thinking in his heart, if that king is thinking I am dissatisfied with him, he's going to cut my head off. He's going to kill me. You say, Preacher, that happened? Oh, yeah, that happened commonly. Uh, Xerxes uh, and Darius, uh, very notable people, uh, uh, only two out of a multitude of them, 
They killed people that they thought were just dissatisfied with them. And be a lot of people in our country that had their heads cut off if that happened today, <laughs> uh, wouldn't there? And so we see that uh, uh, that made him afraid. Now, a person may say that a Christian is not supposed to be afraid. A child of God is not supposed to be afraid. Now, I've tried to tell you many times that if you don't respect your opponent, you're going to get bit. If you don't respect your opponent, you're going to get bit. Now, if you don't, uh, you say, I'm, I've heard people say, I'm not afraid of anything. Now, I'm going to say that if anybody tells me that they're not afraid of anything, I'm going to have one or two thoughts. The big one is, they're not, uh, they're not too smart. And uh, the big thought is that they're not too smart. Uh, I found out playing sports, and I have found out down to the year, if you don't have a fear of your opponent, you're going to get beat. And I've gone into some games that, man, uh, just relax, and you're going to get beat. And so that we find that we need to respect our opponent. I know there's a verse, and I want you to listen to it carefully, a perfect love casteth out fear. But think through that verse. Now, uh, let me make a statement here. Uh, and when fear, if we let fear control, if fear controls us, we're making fear more powerful than God. Now, you say, then, what about fear? We're to uh, fear, we are fear those things about us, but may not to let it control us. Now, I hope you understand what I'm trying to say here. We're to Fear, but not let it control us. If we let it come to the place that fear par paralyzes us, that we can't act, fear it to us is more powerful than God. Now, so perfect love casts us out fear that I quoted there a while ago. It pushes fear aside that we're not paralyzed, but we're believing God to go on. And so he was afraid but he was not paralyzed. He knew that there's the consequences if he, his king thought he was dissatisfied, but he was not paralyzed. Now, I want you to notice that to hear that in that sense then, and the king said, and, uh, and said unto the king, now realizing real quickly, realizing very quickly that if the king thought he was very dissatisfied, Nehemiah and wisdom came and made the statement, let the king live forever. I'm not dissatisfied. Let your reign go on and on and on and on. Let it continue forever. I'm not dissatisfied with you. Let your reign go on and continue. And so why should my countenance be sad? Why should not my countenance be sad? And then he goes ahead to give. God has opened the door. The king has opened the door. He asked him, why are you sad? Why are you sad? And uh, so uh, Nehemiah took there, I'm not dissatisfied with you. I pray that your reign will go on forever. But here, why should I not be uh, dissatisfied? Why should not my countenance be sad? When the city or the place of my father's sepulchers lieth in the waste, and the gates thereof are co consumed with fire. God opened the door. Here, when he asked the question, why are you sad? God op uh, took that as a means of taking an open door, entering the open door. You and I, that when God opens doors for us, we need to go in. When a door is open, you and I need to walk in an open door when God opens a door. And uh, I said, go ahead and uh, do what that God wants. Then the king then, once that the door was opened and uh, given unto him, the king said unto me, in verse 4, For what dost thou make request? Now, isn't that interesting? Uh, now how fast that things have changed? Now, I know how long did we say that Nehemiah had waited? Four months. And now, after four months of patiently waiting, do you see then that when we patiently wait, and I don't mean to, when God shows us that we just sit down and do nothing, but he patiently was uh, actively, patiently, actively 
waiting upon God. And now all of a sudden, bang, God's time is ready. And the door is open. And the king made request. Isn't that a wonderful thing there? And so now, notice what Nehemiah did. He prayed there. Notice standing on his feet. Uh, some people think you can't pray unless that you're on your knees. And uh, you can pray sitting down. You can pray standing up. If you could stand on your head, you could pray standing on your head, couldn't you? But you can pray in any position. You can pray at night and uh, when you're laying in bed. And so he hastily, Nehemiah was a man of well, very quick prayers. And he prayed a quick prayer unto God. And I said unto the king, if it please the king, and if my sir, and if thy servant, notice he says, I'm your servant. If thy servant have found favor in thy sight, and if thou wouldest send me into Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. I want to build it up. I want to do that. And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him. Now I wondered, do you ever wonder why the significance of the queen also being in the, inserted in here. One little phrase, and the queen was sitting by him. I sometimes ask questions. I wonder in my mind, what significance does the queen? Here's the king, he's doing all the talking, all the questioning, and all of a sudden, and the queen was sitting by his side. And that's all it said about her. And I think that she was very important. You know that sometimes a woman has a very uh, important way of swaying a man, doesn't she? Uh, her opinion. In uh, Eastern, uh, Eastern societies at that time, uh, the queen often uh, influenced uh, the king. Do you remember Esther? Do you remember how the, the queen Esther, that how that she influenced the, uh, the king? And so I believe that she's sitting, uh, her sitting there, that it was a means of God saying that she had an important part influencing the king by sitting there. And so let's continue now. And moving on downward. And the king said unto me, the queen sitting by him, for how long shall the journey be? It's a good question. How, do, how long is this going to be? And when will thou return? And so it pleased the king to send me. Now there's success. There's the success. He is going to his father's home. He is going to rebuild the wall. Now, it's been about 150 years to get that job done. And uh, let me just interject here. It's been a long time since I read it uh, there a few months ago. And uh, uh, it's, what was it, 54 days or something in that sort that they completed the wall when he got there? But I want you to notice the success. It pleased the king to send me. And I set him a time. As a matter of fact, he's going to be gone the first trip 12 years. <laughs> Uh, he's going to be gone 12 years. I don't know if he told the king 12 years or not. I'm sure he did. I don't know if he even knew it's going to be that long. More I said, more I said unto the king, if it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may con convey me over till I come into Judah, and a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams of the gates of the palace that appertaineth or pertaineth to the house, and for the wall of the city, and the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of God upon me. Now, I want us to talk here just a minute now, and uh, let's just uh, reflect here just a little bit, and uh, may go over just a second. But uh, I want us to look here, his secrets. What made him successful? Why was he successful? You and I, that as we look here at doing this, and we're going to see it just in this little reading right here, and I want you to follow with me. I want you to notice six, seven things I'm going to talk about uh, here that the reason he was successful. It will be in business, and it will be in following Christ. And I want to think of it in, uh, when I say business, uh, any, any endeavor that a person go, they would fit in. But I want us to think in doing God's work. First of all, he was loyal to the king. Uh, he was half-hearted to the king. He was loyal to the king. And uh, he stood by the king. Uh, I was always loyal to the school system. They gave me a job. Now some things, did I like everything? Did I smile about everything? Was everything joyous? Uh, Mr. Aker that gave me the first job, I always thought that he was one of the most delightful men that I ever met, and he was. 
And I was loyal to him. And I was loyal to the school system. I stood, I stood with the school system. I was, uh, 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 and so, uh, employ I get disgusted sometimes that the employer, that's in our relations today, that there's not much loyalty today, you know? It's not loyalty to church. A lot of people are not loyal to church. And uh, I ask uh, some people sometimes, are you loyal to your job? Are you loyal to your church? Are you loyal to your Savior? And uh, one person answered me one time, I'm only loyal to God. Well, that's a uh, giveaway question. Everybody, every Christian ought to be loyal to God. But if somebody hires you and you're working for somebody, you ought to be loyal to them, shouldn't you? But may I say that's here to put it here for you and me. You and I will never be successful as Christians, and no one will ever be successful for Christ unless they're loyal to their Savior. That is, if we want to put it in a word, faithful. We must be faithful. And a, a person's not faithful, and he's not dedicated, he's not surrendered to that, he's not loyal, I, he's not dependable. And so I, Mark and them, they hire somebody down there for Eastman Credit Union. He doesn't want somebody to say, hey, if I were you, I'd go to Wells Fargo, I'd go to the First Bank, I, want some, I, wouldn't, uh, I don't do anything, you just put your money in here and let us use it, and, uh, or whatever, you go to another bank and so forth. You want, uh, you want your people to be loyal there on the job. All right, second, uh, humbleness. He was humble. He went before the king. He wasn't arrogant, but he had humility. And uh, if we, uh, God says, humble ourselves, therefore, before God. Humble ourselves to him. I think that uh, we could use a word here in his case, politeness. Uh, we could use that as a word there for he was polite, wasn't he? Uh, but to humbleness, lowliness of spirit, uh, he that exalteth himself <coughs> shall be abased. <coughs> but he that humbled himself shall be exalted. And so that we find in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we need not think of ourselves more important than we are, but to humble ourselves before him. And when he says that uh, when we humble before him, he'll lift us up. And so that uh, whether it's on a job or whatever, we need to have a humble spirit uh, of ourselves and be polite in that. Secondly, thirdly, honest. Honest. He was honest. Uh, he didn't try to lie. But in his success, he told the truth. And one thing that we see about this, he, uh, he said, told us, I'm afraid. I, he speaks that honestly. I was afraid. And uh, he speaks to the king, and he tells of the king of the ruins of his father. And he was honest as to why that he wanted to go, why, what he wanted to accomplish. May I say that in our lives, if we're not honest, and we don't have integrity to tell the truth, and people know that our life, that it's not clean, and uh, people, uh, well, wherever it is, Whatever position that a person shows, if his life is not clean, honest, and a life that is consecrated, set aside, he is no good for God, and he is no good for man, because that God can't use a clean, excuse me, a dirty vessel. He only can use a clean vessel. But here he was honest. He was forthright. He was truthful, and in speaking the truth. And so that you and I, that we are honest before God and man. When we say something, it should be that uh, we're honest about it. Now, uh, this one, uh, we see that he was a man of prayer. And uh, as a man of prayer, uh, he, uh, we see that there, right in the occasion, he stopped and prayed. A little sentence. A little sentence prayer. Eight times in the book of Nehemiah, you can go through some time and read the book of Nehemiah. Eight times in the book of Nehemiah, all of a sudden, Something happening, all of a sudden he stops and he prays a little spontaneous prayer. A little short prayer. Uh, I got to thinking about this. Do we have to pray long prayers to get results? No. Do we, uh, we don't, do we? Uh, our preacher, I'll go ahead and say that. Our preacher used to say when he called on somebody to pray at church that they prayed on and on and on and on. He said, I can tell they've not been praying in a while. they got to get caught up. But then, uh, I don't know about that part. But anyway, uh, short prayers in public, I guess, is what he was saying. 
and long, long prayers in private. And so uh, that, but he, uh, his prayers were short. And I got to thinking uh, about this, that uh, the short prayers that he prayed, uh, the Bible prayers, with the exception of maybe one or two, Bible prayers, uh, well, the Lord prayed the whole 17th chapter of uh, John, and uh, but, uh, he was on his way to the cross and praying for them and praying for us. But uh, we find that uh, well, the, one of the greatest, most impactful prayers that you see was Elijah's prayer there on Mount Carmel, 63 words. And so he prayed. The thing is to pray. And uh, so then the fifth thing, he planned. And it was evident that he planned. And you say, preacher, how was it evident to you that he planned? He was a planning man. And you're going to see that later on, that he was, uh, if we go that way, he planned. You say, how do you know that he planned? And when the, uh, the king asked him about the journey, he told him how long. He told him how long. If he didn't know how long, he wouldn't be able to, to and if he hadn't been planning, he wouldn't know how long. Now we see that he planned because he could tell some things that he needed and some letters that need to be sent. He was planning. Now we could put this in another way, have a goal, something we want to reach, and something that we want to uh, uh, reach in our life. And uh, some people have secular goals, but you and I as Christians need to have goals. Yeah. And as uh, Christians, uh, uh, we ought to pray, Lord, let me win somebody to Christ, or help me, Oh, God, and I want uh, my Sunday school class to go. I, uh, Lord, I want the church to grow and uh, set a goal for things happening uh, in our church life, in our personal life, to reach something happening for the Lord Jesus Christ. And he knew his goal. He knew he wanted to accomplish something. And so Paul says, forgetting those things which are behind, I reach forth unto those things which are before. Amen. And so that what he is talking about, I have a goal reaching forth for something out there in the future uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ. Then, sixthly, and this last one I'm going to give, and I may give a little bit of a extra, a few little things in there. Dependence upon God. Dependence upon Him. And whatever that we do that God has called, that we need to depend upon the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, for that strength for that vision, for that courage, for the opportunities, for the finances, or whatever that is needed. We need to depend upon God, lean upon Him, and let Him do the leading. Now, let me just say that here, and I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. When God gives us a burden, and we've been talking about reaching success, and I'm talking about depending upon God here for the last one. When God gives us the burden, when you and I make the effort, he begins to open the doors for us. And so that we see that here that now that to find when he was making the effort, depending upon God, and there's a, there's a thing that God wants us to lean upon him, but what I'm trying to say that leaning upon them, there is some personal responsibility that we have to make effort and go forward with God that, and that he could lead before us. We've got to get up and be ready and available in our life. And while that we're waiting upon him and depending upon him, we need to do the planning and the preparation and the thoughts in our mind and all of those things and to have some personal responsibility in our life that we can depend upon him is true. Now, in depending upon him and using that personal, uh, 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 personal responsibility that we have in his leadership that he has given it upon him, so uh, that personal responsibility will ask us for that balance in our life. What can we achieve? How can we achieve this? Uh, pers uh, this uh, the personal dependence. First of all, depending upon God and knowing what God's will and his purpose is, first of all, we need to be consultants of the word of God to know that, uh, that dependence, know what he says. 
The important thing is, know what he says. Now, secondly, in that personal dependence upon God, we need to uh, talk sometimes and oftentimes to godly, mature Christians. Now, notice I say godly, mature Christians. Don't just run and grab somebody. We don't want to just run. uh, We want to go to somebody that has had the experience. We know that studies God's word. We know that there are people that we can trust through covenants. We know that there are people that have influence and an integrity and an understanding of God and have gone down the path and can give us some wisdom in helping us and understanding our God's will and our dependence upon him. Now, there's a few people in my life that have been very encouraging in my life. There are some preachers that have been very encouraging in my life, giving me godly wisdom, encouraging me, and strengthening me. And so in our lives, yes, we depend upon God, but oftentimes in depending upon God, there's a responsibility, and that responsibility of knowing of what to do, we consult God's Word. If it's not in relationship to God's word, and if it's not what God in harmony with God's word, it's out of sync. And then we may find somebody that can help us to come in and consult us and to bring us in to help us to understand more of God's will. Thirdly, in this thing of dependence upon God, that the circumstances should not discourage us. If something bad happens, Now, we're wanting God's will. We're depending upon God. Circumstances should not discourage us. But circumstances uh, should be there as a means that to put them off to the side and don't look at the circumstances. If they're bad, God said that sometimes the old devil will set something out there to discourage us and to keep us out of God's will, keep us depending upon God. And so the circumstances. And then carefully examine yourself all the time. And so it's a dependence upon God. Not just some affirmation one time, well, God, I'm depending upon you, but to every day of our life, every moment of our life, and walking with God, we need to have that affirmation uh, that we're depending upon Him and trusting Him. And sometimes our way, uh, sometimes the things can get in our way. And that's the reason that we've got to examine ourselves to see if we have drifted, got off of the purpose, out of God's main line of his guidance. Now, let me give you some examples of here. Now, God sent me here. And uh, uh, when I came here, I came out, walked out, before I even came here as a pastor, y'all voted me in. And, uh, but I came over here and I stood on the property and uh, asked for God's will, his guidance, his leadership, and accepting this responsibility. I hadn't been here a week. I hadn't been here one week, uh, maybe a week, maybe one or two days over a week. I got a telephone call. That telephone call was from a large church. It was a good church, big church. And the man on the other end of the line said, Brother Hall, what would it take to get you to come over and be our pastor? Now, what would you say? I mean, they had everything. They had gyms. They had, uh, they had everything. And uh, so I just told you all that I'd come. I just told this church I'd come. I was, uh, and, uh, and so I uh, said, listen, brother, if you'd ask one other time, I may have preferably considered it. But since I've been here, there have been opportunities to leave. But I've stayed here because why? It's not because I uh, didn't have opportunity just a few months ago, well, maybe uh, longer than that now, that I got a telephone call from a big uh, from a preacher a uh, church up in Virginia wanted me to come be their pastor. He said, you may have to move. And he said, uh, you may not want to do that. Now, I say that to tell you this, that when we are in God's work, there will be circumstances that you've got to weigh carefully yeah. to keep you. And uh, so uh, I have told you, God wanted me here, and I'm here, it looks like, for the final, final ring. I don't think it'll stop now, but anyway, I don't know. I may say that in tonight. He may send me somewhere else, but I don't think so. Don't plan to. Don't plan to. I've told you I thought you are the best people in the world. You better stay true to that, okay? All right, you better stay true to that. All right. And uh, so 